Where in Cape Town, where in 2007 the Cape Town Open Education Declaration was signed. And we are here with the people who were already here in 2007. And I would like to introduce you, or have you introduced yourselves? Who are you today? What are you doing now? And what were you doing in 2007? You were not here, you may begin. Hi, my name is Alek Tarkowski. I run a Polish NGO called Centrum Cyfrowe, the digital center, which does a lot of work on open policy. And as you said, I'm the one person that wasn't here. In 2007, I was already doing Creative Commons Poland. That's my other job. Uh, but I was focusing mainly on science and open data. And only then, in the meantime, move into the space of open education. Uh, hi, my name is Delia Brown. I am from Sydney, Australia. I'm the national copyright director for the Schools and TAPES, which is the Technical and Further Education Institutes of Australia. I was the same position back in 2007 as I am today in 2017. Um, the only difference between that time and now is I'm actually now one of the affiliates for Creative Commons in Australia. So back in 2007, I was a, a very early kind of press ganged volunteer working in open education. Um, when I, you know, you know, in 2007, where I was invited to the Cape Town Decoration. So that was me 10 years ago and also today. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Melissa Hageman with the Open Society Foundations, and I worked with OSF uh, 10 years ago as well. At that time, I focused um, on open access, and um, I was asked to see what we could do in the space of open textbooks, and that's one of the ways that we decided to organize this meeting. Um, so since that time, I've uh, been working on both open access, open educational resources, and copyright reform. Hello. My name is Philip Schmidt. Ten years ago, I actually lived in Cape Town. Uh, my life was a lot better. Um, <laughs> now, I worked at University of the Western Cape, and I was just about to co-found with Delia, actually, a peer-to-peer -peer university. And today, I live in Boston, where it's very cold, and I work at the MIT Media Lab. So who invited 10 or 11 years ago? Who brought this up? Why a Cape Town declaration in the first place? So... I think all three of us had been together at the Open... No, Dubrovnik. In Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik. I Boy, the I, I Commons. Summit. The I Summit. The I Summit in Dubrovnik in, like... 2007. June of 2000. Sorry, June of 2007. And Philip was one of the organizers of the Open Education Session, I believe, with yeah, Mark Sermon. With with Mark Sermon and um, one of and Arash, and one of the ideas that came up during that meeting in Dubrovnik was that um, it was said that we need a BOAI for OER, and the BOAI is a Budapest Open Access Initiative, which first defined open access and developed strategies um, for achieving. Um, open access, and my organization played a role in that. So um, uh, Mark Surman, who was with Shuttleworth at the time, and Kareen Besenhout and I sat down and said, well, let's do a BOAI for OER. And so we ended up gathering together about 20 f people and inviting them here to Cape Town, and that meeting happened in September. So it was a very quick turnaround from our meeting in Dubrovnik. Let's skip the middle part, because everyone can read the declaration on the internet or they learned it by heart so it's like the donut we don't talk about the whole <laughs> but about the story around it um, was it more like a master plan and 20 people coming together and now we need a declaration or how did it proceed wow how did it proceed 10 years ago you're really testing my memory um No, it, it was a kind of grassroots, um, agile creative thinking project over a day and a half with using kind of open facilitation methodologies, spectrograms, breakout sessions, um, and with us kind of deciding what the core issues we needed to address in order for to have a, a document that kind of had a vision and values of open education and open education resources. And at that stage, the, I suppose the focus probably was on we need to open up content. We need to help you know, have more open content, open education resources to basically to get the dream of equity of education and access to education. Um, so it was kind of a, a day and a half or two days of really kind of like quite messy thinking, but really good thinking because you get very creative with a bunch of people that some of us hadn't met before. Um, so think of it like a, like a boot camp. 
uh, of kind of of dumping ideas and then pretty much middling groups consensus deciding what was the important issues to kind of really delve into. And at the end of that process, it kind of came up with, with a core idea of getting a declaration ba- very similar to the Budapest Open Access Declaration. But we still had a lot of work, but it was just the idea of doing it. And then it was given to a bunch of, well, actually, I think, I think four or five of us were volunteered. We were volunteered. I don't remember actually putting my hand up, but apparently we were volunteered to come with a, with a draft document to try and encapsulate what we had a general consensus with. And then lots of feedback from the other participants at the, um, at the meeting. And so even though we decided to start this in September, we didn't actually have a declaration until January the following year in 2018. And over that process, those 20 people worked very, very hard, 2008, sorry, yeah. We worked very, very hard to kind of get to the final document we got in the end. Alec, you were not here, so you have the part of telling the world that it really had an impact. It's hard to say our declaration had an impact, but you can say their declaration had a really huge impact. I think so. I'm observing it sort of from outside. I can only say how important such documents are. And I actually think maybe writing it and focusing on what's the right wording and how to coordinate, you might have not appreciated it. Movements need some focal points, you know, something that's agreed upon, something that's referenced. Even more importantly, people outside of the movement need sort of clear-cut guidance what this is about. And, and the declaration did exactly that. It took some ideas which were present before, you know, for several years, but made it into this form that you can just put on the table uh, and both internally and the movement say, okay, this sounds good, we agree with it, so we're going to follow lead. And also we can show it for institutions and, you know, when you come to them and say there's a declaration. And I also I like the fact that it's, it's a grassroots one. It's signed, signed by organizations. I appreciate also documents that are governmental. We need both. But here the fact that you can show to people that it's just consensus across the world from different countries, from different perspectives, uh, and one you can agree with, I think that's very powerful. So now in 2017, Uh, we're not only celebrating uh, 10 years of Cape Town Declaration, but also thinking about <laughs> what could be added to the ideas of 2007. What would you put in if you wrote another de- Cape Town Declaration in 2017? Well, I think you'll get very different answers if you ask the four of us. But um, I think there are two, two possible directions. One is there are some areas that have grown out of the work that all of us have, have been doing that seem obvious to add, like data analytics, uh, uh, or l- just learning data, actually, in general, um, and how do we make sure that people share, share data. But I think there's also a different trajectory this could take, which is maybe to be a little more ambitious in terms of um, how people are learning. Because there's a lot of stuff that's happening outside of the, the traditional open world things like YouTube, you know, you have people learning all kinds of things of YouTube. And I think it would be interesting to find a way to bring the values that we have as a community into a community that's emerging around something like YouTube that's inherently not open. But actually, I think the people who use YouTube to learn probably share a lot of the values that we share. So how do we find a way to build bridges between our community and that community? Um, but yeah, we, we, we are actually discussing kind of is there going to be an addendum? Is there a Cape Town 2 or 10? Or, you know, how do, we, how do we take what we've done today and what we've heard today and uh, share that with other people um, in a way that is still exciting and kind of grassroots and has that spirit of the original declaration? A living document. Well, a living document, just like the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Didn't it take like 10 or 15 years to come up with like the amendments? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hopefully, hopefully faster. Huh? <laughs> okay. What else would you add or what could not be changed anyway? We want to add something, don't we? We should do. Well, the three oh, of us, we oh like the God. Supremes. I think that we might the be in consensus the here. Oh, Philip, Philip gave a lead here. I think that we're in agreement that we need to add um, some aspect of copyright reform to it. Um, The OER and the copyright communities have much in common, and I think we can be strengthened by more closely collaborating with each other. So drawing that out in the Cape Town Declaration, I think, could be very helpful. That's plus one and plus one. And minus one. Mm. And yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So not a consensus, but the majority. (laughs) Anything else? 
I think that um, there was more energy at the end of the afternoon than we had anticipated. Yeah, actually, that's that a good cool. point. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have to, as, as Philip referenced, we have to really sit down and think about what our next steps are going to be now. Yeah, and as we came into this, I think we had questions about what's the right strategy to take this forward. Because you could say on one hand, well, we've had a huge amount of success. And so, you know, we're kind of, let's just carry on with what we have and not rock the boat too much. And we were curious to see who would show up and, and how they would engage. And it felt very similar to the original meeting, actually. Yeah. And people were excited and they wanted to talk about new ideas. And so, yeah, I think now we've got a good problem that we have to figure out what to do with all of that. I think now we're more sophisticated and we understand there's more sophistic sophisticated <laughs> issues we have to contend and, and deal with. And it's, a, it's always a journey. Like learning is a journey. So, so is this. So I think... That's beautiful. I know sometimes I can be poetic for a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but no, I think this is it's a living document or a living values or a living um, kind of dream or, or strategy we're trying to achieve. But I think it's a dream actually. Which our vision. Our yeah. vision, yeah. Well, I, I would just add that, that on top of, additionally to things that I agree that should be added, I think it's important to say that the core stays the same in two senses. Uh, there is a core of values. This is what Delia said, you know, um, I think that's important. We shouldn't focus on tools. We should adjust tools while keeping the values. And that's what Philip said. Maybe thinking about big online platforms, we'll start talking about some other things than just, for instance, licensing. But some core ideas about equity, about freedom to learn, you know, about personal empowerment stay the same. Uh, and I think the term open hopefully also stays the same. But, but also the core, which is about things like having resources that are available and having the right to reuse them, and actual reuse that stays, right? No one said that after 10 years either that work is done or that idea is wrong. And I think that's also important to remember that some things, you know, are here for the long run, some values. When everyone's nodding, it's a good point to end the video. Thank you. All the best for your work. Thank you. Thanks.